Now, as a child, weren't you taught not to play with your food? Well, apparently these astronauts weren't. Floating jello cubes across the cabin while in zero-g is a lot of fun. But it is also a sign of a potential problem called space euphoria. No one ever considered that extreme happiness in space could become a severe problem. But it can become a serious problem, and that's no kidding. For many years, space euphoria went undetected, although it was right there, front and center, for all to see. When Apollo 14 astronaut Alan Shepard smuggled golf balls onto the moon and tried to create a tiny moon for the moon by attempting to hit a golf ball into orbit around the moon, everyone thought it was funny. Apollo 16 astronaut Charles Duke thought it would be funny if he tried to compete with the 1972 Olympic athletes back on Earth. He attempted to outjump the Olympic athletes to benefit from the 1-6 gravity on the moon. Duke jumped so high that he rotated onto his back and fell crashing onto the life support system in his backpack. It could have been a fatal fall if the bag had cracked. Duke's commander, John Young, said, That's not funny. And it sure wasn't. Yet, when Apollo 17 astronauts began dancing and singing children's nursery songs while collecting rock samples, everyone still thought it was cute. Space euphoria again went unnoticed. As early as 1965, when Ed White became the first American to walk in space on a tethered spacewalk, his space euphoria became evident. He stayed out much longer than was necessary to test his mobility with the very first jetpack, or MMU as it was called, officially the manned maneuvering unit. In his own words, I'm not coming back. This is fun. Finally, when ordered to return to his Gemini spacecraft, Ed White said it was the saddest day of my life. Obviously, something sinister is at work with space euphoria. Weightlessness, combined with the view of Earth passing below, creates an exhilaration that overcomes all sense of duty. It is the great danger of space euphoria. Now, in hindsight, the effects of space euphoria could be seen when Apollo 17 astronauts drove the lunar rover on the moon. They exceeded the recommended speed limit and could be heard whooping and yelling as the rover rocked onto two wheels, even becoming airborne at times. Canadian astronaut Chris Hadfield was busy at work during his tethered EVA extravehicular activity when he paused to look over his shoulder. The glory of space smacked him in the face. He was so emotionally overwhelmed at the magnificent beauty of the Milky Way galaxy that tears began to fill up Hadfield's eyes. Now in space, tears do not flow down your cheeks. They pool up in your eyes. Hadfield had become blinded by tears of joy. But Hadfield, against protocol, refused to tell his supervisors on Earth. Only after he was no longer able to work did Hadfield speak a famous quote, Houston, I have a problem. It was a direct result of space euphoria. Astronaut Hadfield managed to get back into the space shuttle, but his EVA was not fulfilled. Space euphoria had interfered. There is another aspect of space euphoria that deserves serious attention. It is something called the overview effect. Weightlessness in space affects everything from the physical and psychological health of the astronauts to the physics of using all the mechanical equipment of the spacecraft. However, weightlessness in space is not due to a lack of gravity. Astronauts orbit Earth less than 300 miles up, called LEO, low Earth orbit. There's plenty of gravity in low Earth orbit. The Earth's gravity keeps the Moon in orbit, and the Moon is about 250,000 miles away. In fact, a 150-pound astronaut would weigh 142 pounds in LEO. Weightlessness in space is due to freefall, not lack of gravity. What goes up must come down. The rocket blasts off, and about 8 minutes later, the engines shut off. The spacecraft begins to fall back to Earth. Fortunately, by this time, the rocket has achieved orbital velocity, which is about 17,500 miles per hour. So that it falls towards Earth, but never hits the Earth. It keeps falling and falling around and around, precisely in the same curved path as the surface of the Earth. It's in orbit. It is free fall. Even though everyone calls it zero-g, it's not. If you were to place a bathroom scale under your feet when in free fall, it would show zero you would weigh nothing. That's because the bathroom scale is falling too. The exciting thing is that astronauts retain all their muscle power. Their mass stays the same. Therefore, they can lift heavy equipment in space that would weigh hundreds or even thousands of pounds on Earth. 
astronauts become superhumans in space. And that creates another unusual situation. There are lots of unusual situations in space. On the very first trip to the moon, the Apollo 8 astronauts were not even scheduled to look back and photograph the Earth. Apollo 8 astronauts took only a limited number of pictures of Earth. That's unusual and kind of weird. But Earthrise from the moon became perhaps the most influential environmentalist picture of the 20th century. And it wasn't even planned. But this is the key to understanding the overview effect. Surprise at the unexpected. Even today, almost all globes of Earth are not of Earth. Globes in schools and libraries show each country, usually in different colors. Each country, sure enough, contains a star. But it is to mark the capital city of that country. It is not how the Earth looks from space. These globes are not globes of the planet Earth. In fact, it isn't easy to even find a globe of the planet Earth. Read the labels on these classroom globes. The geopolitical world. These are globes of a place called the world. There is no planet called the world. The world does not live in space. It lives on someone's desk or shelf. The definition of space is geological in origin. Space is defined as existing up to, but not including, the atmosphere of Earth. Earth isn't even an astronomical object. It explains why the very first mission to the Moon, the Apollo 8 mission, had not scheduled any pictures of Earth. Selfies weren't invented then. It also explains why the psychological impact of seeing Earth rise from the Moon was so profound. It was a unique and totally new perception for which any and all humans were utterly unprepared. Seeing Earth in space was a complete surprise. Imagine yourself floating in space outside the spacecraft. You are surrounded by the Milky Way galaxy blazing with millions of stars. The planet Earth is a blue marble passing beneath your feet. Pretty heady stuff. How would you react? Would it change you? Apollo 9 astronaut Rusty Schweiker felt strongly that he was what he called the sensing element for humanity. What does he mean? It's the overview effect kicking in. Schweiker felt that he was connected to all the people on Earth. He compared it to being born into a new existence. And astronaut Schweiker is not the only one who felt the overview effect. Apollo 14 astronaut Edgar Mitchell had this to say about being in space. It was rather an extension of the same universal process that evolved our molecules. And what I felt was an extraordinary personal connectedness with it. I experienced what has been described as an ecstasy of unity. I not only saw the connectedness, I felt it and experienced it sentiently. I was overwhelmed with the sensation of physically and mentally extending out into the cosmos. Some years after returning from space, astronaut Mitchell started an institute to study the brainwaves of people who had been in space. And yes, they are different. According to Mitchell's institute's research, the euphoric sensation of oneness with the universe creates brainwaves similar to meditating monks. Mitchell's studies were so significant that NASA launched a special space shuttle mission in 1998 just to study the effects of space on the brain. The Neurolab mission studied brain cells of laboratory animals, and the astronaut crew too, as brain cells tried to adapt to the freefall environment in low Earth orbit. Well, we can't all be astronauts. But now, we can all access virtual reality experiences of what the astronauts saw in space. The internet has opened up our Earth-bound point of view to share the unity and oneness of the overview effect and give us a small taste of the space euphoria astronauts get in space. Yep, your brain will grow by roughly 2% if you venture into space. Under normal gravity, it is thought that fluid in the brain naturally moves downwards when we stand upright. But there is evidence that lack of gravity prevents this, which is why fluid accumulates in the brain and skull. While a bunch of flowers may be fragrant for you, there are people with cacosmia who would beg to differ. They perceive all the smells out there as something odorous. Well, that stinks. Speaking of which, out of all the senses we have, smell is the most acute one. We remember 65% of smells after a year, but only 50% of what we've seen over the last three weeks. We also get a new nose every 28 days, because the nose cells are renewed every 4 weeks. We don't smell when we sleep. Well, of course, unless you haven't bathed in a while. 
your sense of smell goes to sleep when you do, which is why it's almost impossible to notice a gas leak at night. While sleeping, we rely only on sound because the sleep can be disrupted by noise. Almost half of your taste buds will have gone away by the time you turn 60. So maybe you will finally start eating those broccoli. Your sense of smell gets less acute as you get older as well. As for taste again, we mostly rely on our smell since it helps us perceive up to 95% of the flavor. Without the sense of smell, it'd be hard to tell an apple from a turnip. Now, when you cough, you release the air at about 60 miles per hour, so mind the speed limit. Hiccups is a two-step process. First, you draw in a lot of air because of a muscle spasm, and then bang! The airways are closed, the air is blocked, and the famous sound goes outside. We need ears, not only for hearing, but for balance, too. Our vestibular system occupies the inner ear. Canals in your inner ear contain fluid and tiny sensors helping you keep the balance. By the way, ears have bones. These are also the only bones that never grow. We can hear thanks to these little guys since they transmit sound vibrations. Doctors call them oscular chain, and it's made up of malleus, incus, and stapes, nicknamed hammer, anvil, and stirrup, which are integral parts of the middle ear. Our ears keep growing throughout our lives. They sweat too, and earwax is actually a kind of sweat they produce. Oh, by the way, the nose never stops growing either. Perhaps from all the lies. <laughs> Your heart is the only muscle that never gets tired. The aorta is massive. Its diameter is almost as large as a hose in your garden. All the bones in our body are connected to each other except for the hyoid, which doesn't articulate with the other bones. This bone serves as support to your tongue, and it's one of the rarest bones to break. If you have red eyes in a photo, blame it on bouncing light. The flash jumps off the capillaries in your retina, creating that effect. As for eyes, the coolest camera so far has 200 megapixels. The human eye has 576. That's why sunsets are so much better in real life than in photos. A roller coaster actually tosses your organs around. When you feel like your stomach's falling down, it's really flipping inside your body. Lips are much more sensitive than fingers, having around a million nerve endings. They are 100 times as sensitive as the tips of the fingers. Grooves and furrows make our lip print unique, just like fingerprints are. They also remain unchanged throughout our life. Oh, the tongue print is unique too, by the way. Even though all the people on Earth have an absolutely unique smell, Identical twins smell exactly the same. It must be because they have identical genes. Usually, we shed about 50 to 150 hairs a day. An average lifespan for hair is 5 years, and as soon as an old hair says goodbye to your scalp, a new one starts growing immediately. In your body, you carry enough bacteria to fill a can. Bacteria makes about 3 to 5 pounds of your weight, representing 2% of your total weight. Still, most of them are the waste that our body has. A human being has about 20,000 to 25,000 genes. Seems impressive, right? Well, cornflakes have more genes than we do. Luckily, it's about sophistication, not the quantity. Anyway, cornflakes one, humans zero. We consist of many chemical elements, including iron. The iron in our bodies is enough to produce three nails, each one inch long. The carbon that we have can be used for 900 pencils. Our feathers can be used to make quill pens. Wait, that's birds. Never mind. Our liver has a superpower of regenerating if part of it was removed. It can grow back to the size that your body needs. Fat helps our bodies consume vitamins. Such vitamins as A, D, K, and E can be properly absorbed only when fat dissolves. Our bodies have enough fat to produce 7 bars of soap. Uh, don't try this at home. When we're awake, our brain may produce enough energy to turn an electric bulb on. It has 10 watts of power. What's that about? Our belly buttons have an entire animal encyclopedia in them, with a range of about 70 different bacteria. Some of them can be also found in the soil of Japan and even in polar ice caps. 
our bodies actually glow. Anyway, we can't see that with an unaided eye, because the light we emit is 1,000 times less intense than the minimum level we can perceive. Speaking of which, carmine used blushes and lipsticks is red dye made up of ground-up beetles. Oh. Saliva helps to taste food. Our taste buds are ready to perceive it only when it's dissolved by saliva. An eyelash is here to stay for 150 days only. The world eyelash record was about 3 inches long. They're also home for tiny mites. We blink about 4,200,000 times a year, at least once every 8 seconds. Could be cool if we were given a cent every time we blink. We could make more than $100 daily. It may sound crazy, but our bones are stronger than lots of building materials. A cubic inch of human bone can bear about 19,000 pounds making it four times stronger than concrete. The only thing that makes our blood type different is sugar. A, B, and AB types have sugars, while O has none, which makes it perfect for donors. No sugar doesn't make O type less sweet. In fact, it attracts mosquitoes even more than the other blood types. People have only eight blood types, while cows have 800 and possibly more. Like what? Moo positive and moo negative? Our fingernails grow way faster than toenails. They grow almost four times slower because they have less damage than fingernails. Even though we stumble on them often, sudden circulation bursts usually don't last long. Nails don't only help us catch random tiny objects and peel the stickers off. If you didn't have a rigid structure against which to press, you wouldn't be able to judge how firmly to hold anything. Very few people can actually digest milk. The thing is, there's some special enzyme, let's call it a little helper, that breaks down the sugars any milk has. When people grow up, they run out of this enzyme. This sugar's called lactose, so adults that can't digest it are lactose intolerant. 68% of the world's population can not actually digest milk. If you're sleeping, it doesn't mean your whole body rests. In fact, Sometimes your brain has to work even harder when you're asleep. It needs to process tons of information, and reports usually take a lot of time. Humans can't multitask. Really. We need time to switch from one task to another, but if we try to tackle several things at the same time, it's not going to be very productive. Try this one. Lift your right foot and start rotating it in a clockwise direction. Try to write the number 6 with your big toe in the air. Now, check the direction your foot's moving. It's moving in the opposite direction, because to write the number 6, you need to make a counterclockwise movement. It actually takes a bit longer to start a new habit. It's not 100% true that 18 or 21 days are enough, as many people think. The process of getting a new habit can take up to 254 days, but on average, it takes around 66 days for a new habit to become automatic. Let's cut the Earth in half. You can see all of its layers. Here's the inner core. It's about 40 times hotter than the inside of your oven. That's the mantle, an ocean of hot lava. Here comes the crust of the Earth, the solid surface on which our civilization lives. But if you look up, there are many layers besides the atmosphere and the ozone layer. Scientists recently discovered a strange bubble here, which protects our planet from radiation. And nope, it's not the Earth's magnetic field. This bubble is made of radio waves. Our planet grows like a Christmas tree in the radio spectrum. But we're interested in low-frequency waves, the ones that let us keep in touch with submarines. So, radio waves are like light waves, or regular ocean waves. Look at this one. The distance between the two peaks is the wavelength, and the number of these waves over a period of time is the frequency. For example, there are 10 waves in this interval of one second. So, can you guess the frequency of this wave? Yep, it's 10 hertz. Cell phones use waves with a frequency of 300 to 3000 megahertz. So, add six more zeros to that number. But waves of that frequency don't penetrate barriers well. Think of how you lose your cell phone connection when you're driving through a tunnel. That's because there is metal inside. It's a conductive material that weakens the radio waves a lot. Salt water is also a kind of conductor. So, if the submarine is deep enough, the thick layer of water weakens the signal and we lose communication. 
To maintain it, we send fewer waves but make them longer. In the same amount of time, the frequency of the short waves will be much higher than the frequency of the long waves. That's why they're called very low frequency waves. But, as it turns out, these waves travel all over the Earth and even into space. This is where things get interesting. The waves collide with particles of radiation from the Sun. We think of the Sun as a friendly giant giving us light and heat, but it actually emits a lot of harmful radiation. Each flare, or the electrical discharge of material on our home star, causes an even greater burst of radiation. These particles fly to our planet, just as radio waves do. They travel 93 million miles from the Sun to Earth in 8 minutes and crash into our bubble, which acts as a shield. Basically, radiation particles from the Sun accumulate in the radiation belts around the Earth. Our planet's magnetic field traps them, and a recently discovered bubble of very low-frequency waves lies right below this radiation belt. It helps us repel some of the harmful emissions. Analysis of old studies confirmed that the radiation belts used to be much lower and closer to Earth. But when our civilization began to use radio actively, our waves raised that belt higher. No one expected such an effect from simple radio waves, but it'll give us a way to protect astronauts in the future. When you're on Earth, its magnetic field keeps you safe from radiation. You can physically see it when charged solar wind particles make the air particles at the poles of our planet glow. This is an aurora. Next time you admire this beauty, know that it's actually the Earth saving you from some extremely harmful rays. But if you're outside the Earth's magnetic field, somewhere in space, I have bad news for you. Nothing protects you there. This is a big problem for astronauts who spend months on the International Space Station. Perhaps scientists will learn to create protective bubbles of very low frequency waves around space stations and spacecraft. The same is true for other planets. We're probably going to colonize Mars. There is no magnetic field there and nothing can protect you from radiation. But if you create an artificial bubble there, you can reduce the harmful radiation. Another invisible bubble protecting us is the atmosphere. It's like a layer cake or an onion. Each level of the atmosphere has its own properties. The lowest layer that we live in is the troposphere. This layer contains 80% of the weight of all the air on the planet. It's also the main place where water vapor lives. And this is where the machine called weather works. The sun sends rays of energy to the Earth. Our planet's surface reflects them and heats the air in the troposphere. This makes it move and change places with the cold air, so all the wind, cyclones, storms, and tornadoes only happen in the troposphere, up to about 7.5 miles high. That's why commercial planes fly at an altitude of around 6 miles. The wind or other bad weather conditions hardly affect this area, and the air here is not as dense as it is down on Earth. Flying one mile above sea level is like moving through a biscuit. It's hard, but at a six-mile altitude, flying feels like moving through light whipped cream. The plane almost feels no resistance, so it's a win-win. They save fuel and keep the passengers safe. A couple of significant downsides are that it's very cold and you can't breathe there. It's cold because there are very few air molecules to absorb heat from the ground and transfer it to each other. You wouldn't be able to breathe here for the same reason. That's why planes are equipped with oxygen masks, just in case. Let's go a little here. This is the stratosphere. There's even fewer air molecules up here, and that's where the weather probes fly. They're the kind of small balloons with computers people use to predict the weather. This part of the atmosphere also contains the well-known ozone layer. This is our shield against harmful ultraviolet radiation. Ozone is almost the same as oxygen, except it has three atoms in it. When harmful ultraviolet rays enter our atmosphere, they crash into the O3 molecule. The ray breaks the molecule into O2 and another oxygen atom. The ray itself is converted into heat, but the ozone regenerates quickly. A single oxygen atom joins the O2, and the ozone molecule is ready to protect us again. It's the invisible shield that protects us from radiation. It gave birth to all life on Earth. As our civilization developed, we started to emit freon gas into the atmosphere. We used to fill our old refrigerators with it. A single chlorine atom would detach from a freon molecule when in the air, and then it would bind a single oxygen atom. Now, the ozone can't regenerate like it used to. 
Fortunately, we banned the use of such harmful gases, and the ozone layer began to regenerate. Scientists expect it to fully recover in the middle of the 21st century. The stratosphere ends at about 31 miles. The next layer is the mesosphere, the coldest of them all. On average, it's about negative 140 degrees Fahrenheit. That's five times colder than your freezer. This is the layer of the atmosphere where incoming meteors start to ignite because of friction in the air. Then, they will eventually burn up completely. The air here is too thin for airplanes or balloons to fly, but it's still too dense for satellites. So, this layer of the atmosphere is not well studied. The next layer extends from 55 miles above sea level to about 500. That's a little more than the distance between Las Vegas and San Francisco. Carmen Line is situated in this layer of the atmosphere. This is the boundary between our planet and space. The thermosphere is where all our spacecraft and satellites fly. It's also home to the International Space Station. The temperature rises extremely. The air here is about 10 times hotter than your oven can produce. It's all due to solar activity. But you would never be able to feel this heat. The air molecules that carry the heat here are so small that you would literally float between them. Imagine a giant pool with only three drops of water. That's the thermosphere. And the highest layer of our atmosphere is the exosphere. This is the widest layer of our air bubble. Scientists believe its boundaries are about halfway to the moon at 120,000 miles. This is the point where the pressure of solar radiation begins to exceed the Earth's gravity. It's still part of our atmosphere. This means that astronauts who went on various space missions and have been on the ISS have actually never left the Earth's atmosphere.